to the OmniTalk Ask an Expert series. I'm your host, Chris Walton, one of the founders and the editor-in-chief of OmniTalk, the fast-growing blog that is all about the future of retail. Today, we are coming to you live on LinkedIn, and I am joined by Jesse Michael, the Managing Director at AdevMind. Jesse, welcome. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. It's great to have you back. It's great yeah. to have you back. Yeah, you know, for those listening and for those watching live on LinkedIn, too, Jesse is one of our quote unquote experts at OmniTalk. Uh, we have him on regularly because he and Adept Mine, in our opinion, are movers and shakers within the retail and the shopping mall industries. So we're coming to you live right now via the chat. If you guys have any questions, anything strikes your fancy, ask away because Jesse quite honestly probably knows more about how to make malls shoppable online than anyone I have ever met. And if you remember last year, we had him on uh, just, gosh, when was that? When did we have you on last year? Like September, October? October. Yeah. It was right after we launched, I think Centennial's sort of phase one. Phase one, and, right? It was around October. Yep. Yeah. So to bring everybody up to speed, maybe that aren't familiar with that content back in around October, uh, Jesse and Adept Mine uh, announced a partnership with Centennial Malls to make malls shoppable online, so to speak. Uh, and it started with a deliberate approach across different phases. And phase one was in October. We're going to talk to them more about that. But then just a few weeks ago, they actually reached another huge milestone uh, within that process. And now if you go on shopnow.shopmainplacemall.com, you can shop over 1.9 million SKUs across a bevy of retailers at Centennial's main place mall. And those SKUs are available for both pickup and delivery. And I will say that again, 1.9 million SKUs online at main place mall for delivery and pickup. That is some big, big news and some big, big momentum coming off what they were talking about with us back in October. So Jesse, let's kick this off here. Set the context. Remind everyone who is a debt mind. What do you guys do, and, and what has been this? What has been your hypothesis all along in terms of shopping malls and how they need to transform? We are focused on you know leading the retail space, so not just with shopping centers, but right. working with retailers directly as well because we have that whole other side of our business um, on pioneering um, machine learning, data as a service solutions for these different partners. Um, you know, company, I think, as I mentioned before, is we're five years old, you know, still considered a startup, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah for we sure. have some good news coming in terms of funding. I won't ruin it here. But Ooh. Oh, sweet. I didn't know that. Funding okay. that we're able to announce soon enough, um, you know, to, to help with our mission, but really the, the, the key piece is, you know, for shopping centers, the whole idea of this before was you couldn't find specific SKUs of products available in shopping centers before you'd go on a shopping center website or app and you'd be there to, I'm not really sure what. You'd, yeah, you'd I doubt through. many people actually even went there, right? Like that's a whole nother point. It's interesting. There is, you get into some numbers and there's some good traffic that a lot of these, uh, a lot of the owners and operators have, have built up um, through different pieces of functionality. There's different uh -huh. things you can do, whether it's events or offers yes. or, or that type of stuff. Um, but in terms of the actual shopability or pre-planning of your shopping trip, you couldn't do anything. You essentially would look for a store or you look for shoes. Let's say you search for yeah. shoes and you would get a list of stores that sold shoes or you type in, you know, wedge heels and you would get a list of stores in the mall that sold wedge heels, but you would never get specific SKUs. And really this challenge was, was interesting. You mentioned, you know, 1.9 million SKUs. We're actually north of two now. We're around 2.2 million SKUs as we continue to continue to add more stores, uh, especially with local inventory. Um, it really is, it really was anyways, an interesting problem to tackle dealing with, with retailers, you know, and you would know this uh, really well, dealing with retailers direct where, you know, we're working with Alta Beauty is one of our partners. You know, you're, you're dealing with how many SKUs at, at one store? Oh, yeah. I mean, it depends. I mean, it can run the range. Like a convenience store, you could be a thousand, you know, target ish. You're probably 60 to 80,000. Yeah, get fat, 100, 000, more than 100, that. 100,000. Yeah. You're getting into, um, you know, these, these numbers that, you know, fairly manageable when it comes to a search pipeline and data and all right. that sort of stuff. When you go north, north of a million, north of two million, and making that searchable and actually functional is a pretty heavy lift and an, and a, and an amazing 
uh, feet when it comes to this. You know, we talk a lot about making them all shoppable um, from an e-commerce standpoint, but just enabling search right. that works across 2 million SKUs is pretty, pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, and that's, that's really our core competency as an organization, as a company, is uh, our product discovery capabilities, our machine learning engineers. We have 40 people in the company, over half, and I think it was 25 people are in machine learning uh, and our engineering department really, really laser focused on making the shopping experience really, really good for the customer, whether it's in retail or shopping centers. Yeah, I think that's an important point too. So I want to rewind that a little bit. So like what you said, I thought there were a couple of key points you said there for everyone listening, which was one, malls and uh, malls in a lot of ways have had traffic coming to their websites, but they've never actually had, that traffic's never been shopping, so to speak. They've been, you know, looking to see what types of events are going at the mall, maybe what types of retailers are there, but actually as a platform to conduct shopping, that hasn't been happening, number one. And then number two, there's, when you stop and think about it, there's just a tremendous amount of product available at a mall. And in order to collate that and serve it up in a way that it ever even could be shoppable, the first step is really, you gotta have somebody that really understands search optimization, how that works, serving up a great front end experience. That was essentially your step one, right? So back in October, was that the first phase of, of the Centennial Mall plan? It was, okay, let's just make everything browsable, searchable, so we can just have the consumer understand everything that's at play at a given local location? Yeah, and it, it's it's still a part of the uh, mission for us. I mean, there's two, there's kind of two ways to skin a cat here. I mean, you can, you can do just sort of this foundational experience where you make your entire mall shoppable and you've got the wish list feature where people can go on, pre-plan right. their trip, add products to their wish list. And then, you know, share it on social media, share it with a friend, um, you know, print it, send it to their phone. And essentially you're, you're, you're pre-planning your trip to the center because you've got local inventory down to the store level. And that's a key piece that, that we'll get into down to the store level. So they can actually see, Hey, this purple sweater at H and M is actually available today. And I can go to the center and get it, or they can still click out to the retailer's website and, you know, buy it from the retailer and have it shipped to them etc. So that's still a core competency of, you know, sort of the baseline foundational experience. And you're right, that's, that's what we launched with Centennial in, in phase one across their eight properties. Um, so, yeah, and then the so, other way, sorry, and then the other way, obviously, is going that, that last mile approach and, and enabling uh, purchasing and e-commerce directly from, from the experience. Yeah, so let's talk about that, because I think that's where your expertise really comes into play here. And I think that's hopefully what everyone can, I think, can learn the most of, uh, learn the most from today too, which is, okay, that first thing, like you said, there's a lot of ways to think about it, but it's foundational. It's how do you make something really searchable and browsable. People can make their lists if you want, and they engage with certain products. They can be taken out to that retailer's website. It's almost, it's almost akin to like an affiliate kind of model setup, so to speak. But in reality, there's a lot more that can be created within that, you know, standalone experience, especially for people that want to support local commerce. Like say, I want to support my local mall and I want to drive the business for those local stores that are there. And I think people often forget too, that it's not just people, it's the purveyors in malls aren't just the Gap and uh, J Crew and everybody like that, Banana Republic. They're also like local purveyors too. So they stand to benefit from this as well, if you can get people shopping there. So but stage two is far more complicated because stage two, as you guys outlined, it was, okay, how do I actually allow people to shop from these retailers like you typically would in e-commerce marketplace where it comes directly through them all through one consistent checkout process, ordering process, like talk us through going from one to two, because that gets really complicated really quickly from my experience. So we actually make it really easy uh, <laughs> okay. in the sense that, uh, it, in the, on the outside looking in, yes, extremely difficult, but basically what happens is when you go from phase one to two, your baseline experience remains the same. It's There's built, no, right? Built. You're building your foundation. And I think I referred to this last time we spoke. It's like, you're building a house. What do you start with? You yeah. start with foundations. You start with peers. You start with footings. You start with a slab. It doesn't matter. Start with a foundation and then you build the house from there upwards in different ways, different designs. It's a perfect analogy for this. You can design this however you want to. 
And, but essentially you're going from this foundational experience, you've got product discovery, you know, local inventory for, for, you know, for a number of different stores. And then going from one to two essentially is that piece of just turning it on. We, we select a commerce platform, we plug that in, uh, and essentially you've got one single source of truth through a checkout experience. And the key piece to this whole thing is local inventory. Okay. And that, that's really the big change, I would say, um, even from when we spoke in, in October, really the, the interesting sort of, uh, you know, growth for us that we saw was, you know, the pandemic, everybody hates talking about it, obviously, but it forced retailers to move to curbside pickup. In order to have curbside pickup, you needed to have local inventory available for customers on your site. So basically what we saw was pre-pandemic, you know, maybe 15% of retailers, 20% of retailers would have local inventory. In October, when we launched main place, or sorry, when we launched with Centennial across their eight properties, we're maybe around 30%, 40%. Okay. okay. We now have some shopping centers that we're launching with that will be around 75%. Wow, that's incredible. On, on a base of 100, 100 retailers, 125 retailers, you've got 75% local inventory coverage. That's huge. You know, when you, when you really start to break that down and that truly does enable the, the last mile piece with, uh, with commerce and, and obviously starting up your own curbside delivery program, which is something we're enabling or the same day, uh, same day delivery piece, uh, that's also offered through the platform. Right. And, and that is key. And I remember we talked about that last time too. And, and that, that information, once it's available, once the retailers have actually made it visible to the public, that's actually very relatively speaking, easy information to obtain. But I, I do want to call BS on you a little bit, because that is my job. We don't just have tech companies on here. We just kind of reiterate everything they say. It's to really say what we think. And I would actually argue what you said is not easy. You guys may have figured it out, but when you start talking about point of sale integrations, Right. The actual order integration off of that, that starts to get really complicated really fast. And I don't think it's something we should take for granted, but I think everyone needs to listen because I think if the whole industry gets together, we can actually make it really simple. Yeah. But you guys are approaching that in a really unique way with Main Place Mall in terms of, okay, I go online as a shopper, I order something from there. How are you guys making that happen? Where, like you said, there's a there's one checkout for me across multiple retailers. That that ain't easy. How are you doing that? So I'll I'll throw it back at you and say, I said we make it easy. You did. You did. We make it easy. Canadian semantics. Just it's not. Canadian it's semantics. not easy itself. <laughs> so, right. right. It's not easy, but we make it easy. So that's Perfect. that's the uh, that's the difference I would say in those in those two. But um, you're right. It's difficult, and you know we've spent the latter you know predominant back to the pandemic. We spent a year and a half building out the capabilities around inventory and everything else. So yeah, with main place, it's you know you brought up point of sale integration. We know how difficult point of sale integration is. We did our homework. We did our research. Uh, you speak to payments companies. You speak to individual retailers. You understand the nuances, the complexity of uh, tapping into, you know, the purchasing mechanisms within these point of sale systems, the cost behind it, and you would have experience in this in this as well too with your background. Yeah. And it's very difficult. And um, we basically made the decision as an organization to focus on more of the VIP sort of concierge approach to this. Okay. Instead what does that mean? Of, so instead of, um, you know, putting, uh, you know, cost and operational expense and manpower into trying to get point of sale access for one retailer or two or three or four or five, because again, to get of sale access across all retailers would be a massive, massive lift, not impossible, but a massive lift and a heavy expense plus buy-in from the retailer, which who knows if they're going to say yes to. Right. Uh, we made the decision to, uh, you know, launch this solution on our own and just say, Hey, we're going to con or converge all these stores into one basket. And to the customer, you don't know any different to the shopper. You're just adding products to the basket um, they're checking out and they just see one purchase across multiple stores on the back end, we're receiving that transaction or the mall is receiving that transaction. There is a runner in this case, there's a person on site that goes to the individual stores. We've got systems in place to help streamline that and speed 
uh, speed up the, the pick and pack process um, to the point where, you know, some of the, the purchases that we've seen at, at main place already build and delivered within, with under, like we're 40 minutes, you know, picked, packed, delivered. When you start to you start to talk about the compete with Amazon piece to this whole thing, um, I would say that's a key data point out of, you know, what we've seen already is, you know, under an hour from the time you place your order to the time it's delivered. But there is a bit of a manual piece, you know, where there, there is this pick and pack on site. And that's why we're, we're, you know, really rolling with this sort of VIP concierge, concierge uh, idea. Yeah. And, and that's why I personally, that's why I love this because I, th I think you're saying something that's really important for everyone watching this right now is like, there's a lot of people out there that'll say, Oh, we can connect to point of sale systems too for everybody. That, like a lot of times what you're hearing there is they're like talking about like Shopify integrations and things like that. But honestly, that's like me writing a story in CRAN as a kindergartner versus like doing an enterprise grade integration on the point of sale side where that's going to, that's going to be a, a decent chunk of money with each retailer. Now, once you do it once, you can hopefully scale it across, you know, the national landscape too. So I think that comes, but the other point about this that I love is that, you're also still in the testing phase of whether or not this is an idea, right? That are consumers going to gravitate towards this? Are they going to shop in this manner? And by, by doing it this way, where you take a concierge approach and you say, hey, the order's coming to our website. We have a visibility of the local inventory. We're going to get it ready for, for shipping or we're going to get it ready for pickup at the mall at a designated location. That's pretty easy and pretty low cost to test when you're just talking about human labor to make sure that the idea has legs for the long run. That to me seems like a smart stage gauge approach to say, look, this is working. Now retailers, do you want to come on board? Give us the integrations because then we can scale nationally really quickly. Is that the thought process here? Because to me, that makes a freaking ton of sense, but you don't hear people taking that approach all the time. 100%. I mean, yeah, there's there's going to be a bit of labor to this. You know, what we've seen in place so far is you know, one person is great, you know, for, for the test phase most likely have to get in these picks maybe two people and then at you know we have contacts in the industry too we talk a lot there's sometimes at shopping centers um you know massive gift wrapping you know right it takes like 10 15 people on site wrapping gifts at shopping centers right. and you're going they're used to throwing labor at, at and time periods, but it's more of those making it sustainable in between, in between the time mechanisms that we can help, you know, from a revenue generation side uh, to help, you know, sort of for those, pay for those people. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the concept is, yeah, there's, there's going to be some labor in a lot of cases, especially in closed centers, people are there already. There's workers on site and this isn't like a, 12 hour a day, you can put mechanisms in place here to, to limit shopping periods, shopping times. Uh, when you place an order, obviously you can put limits on when it's going to be delivered, uh, order by 3 PM kind of thing. And it'll be delivered by, you know, next day kind of thing. So there's different mechanisms you can put in place to make sure that, you know, the labor side is, is managed. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're developing opportunities to help from a revenue generation standpoint. Well, I never thought about this before too, but doesn't that like, doesn't that fundamentally also make like a better consumer experience too? So like now I'm engaging with the mall and there's, I'm guessing if you get the way you're pulling this off, I mean, I don't think you've said it explicitly, but I'm guessing is like, there's probably a cons uh, one, like one, maybe more points in the store, definitive points in the store where I go as a consumer to pick up goods. We haven't even talked about returns. I want to get to that side, pick up goods, get gifts or get products gift wrapped make returns like that actually is i'm going to need that anyway right like i'm going to need some type of center like that anyway concierge desk like that anyway right exactly and and that's you know haven't been explicit about it but that's where it's going for sure and um again it's about the foundational experience once you have the foundation it's not just the the digital real estate on your site that you can right. start to play with you can start to play with the physical real estate to make this you know super optimal for your for your shoppers and people coming into the center so it's it's not just hey you know order a product and pick it up curbside it's hey order a product it's you know we had a we had an order the other day for mother's day 
and a gentleman ordered a necklace from one of the stores uh, for his wife. And you could layer on gift wrapping to that. You can layer on all these other services you already offer. And that just completes sort of the, the circle to, to everything you were already trying to do before. Um, you're just layering different services that you already have. You got, yeah, right. For sure. And especially like, I can think of the guy on the night before, you know, Christmas or whatever, like, or two days before it's like, Oh my God, I'm going to go to the mall and we get like six things. I'm going to buy six things. That I got to figure out what to do next. Now you're actually saying there's an online portal where, okay, I want these items from these stores. I want the jewelry. I want the pajamas. I want something maybe for myself, have it waiting for me, gift wrap it. Boom. I'm done. And then on the flip sure. side of it, after Christmas, I can, I can return it. Right. So to, how are you solving that? Like, that's always the one that, the smart guy yeah. in the back room raises his hand and goes, well, you haven't figured out returns. Like, what are you doing on that one? Like, yeah, how's that it, work? Uh, again, it's, it's back to the manual piece. I mean, we made a decision consciously to, um, you know, not go after point of sale access. You know, like I said, we have partners in the retail space. I've mentioned one of them already. We've had multiple conversations, not just with payments companies, and, but other you know, experts and retailers themselves saying, how difficult and complex is this? You mentioned scaling it across, you know, an entire country. Uh, there's multiple POS systems, even for one retailer in different locations. Right. They have one POS system in, in most cases. So you're doing that work so much. When you're integrated with point of sale, obviously returns become flawless. The customer sees the purchase coming in from the retailer. They go back to the retailer to return the product. We don't have that in this case there is a bit more of a manual component to it. So again, the, the idea of this sort of in-between shopper, when you, when you make the purchases as, as, the, as the shopper on the site, you see one checkout, you get one purchase, you get one receipt, and then your products are delivered to you, you pick them up. You want to return them, we either give you a shipping label and you send it directly back to the center and to the concierge area. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, for open air centers, we have, you know, specific, specific mechanisms there too, to support with this. Cause in a lot of cases, there's not an enclosed sort of VIP area, but we have mechanisms for open air centers too, uh, to do this. Can't even think of that. Cause I'm in Minnesota and you're in Toronto and like, <laughs> that's all we have is the closed air centers, but yeah, keep going. Little, you know, it's, it's May and it's, still freezing outside. But anyways, um, yeah, the, uh, the concept there really is you can ship it back to the center or you can bring it back yourself and you bring it back to one location. So even if you have, think about this from a streamlining return standpoint, say you've got three things to return and you're the shopper and you go, oh man, I got to go to H&M, I got to go to Foot Locker and I got to go to somewhere else. That sucks. Sucks. It's terrible. It's See, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah, it's awful. And, and it's, it's crowded. crowded. Like, I don't, yeah, no. Having kids, but, you know, we had a kid in a pandemic, you know, I haven't really been to a mall with a kid, but I right. can't imagine it. Like, it sounds <laughs> terrible. Like, I don't know, I don't know about you, but it does not sound fun to bring a toddler to a mall, you know. Not for that a, type of shopping, right? Not for returns, not for returns. Like, no, that's, that doesn't make sense. Right. You know, you, nobody wants to do that. But imagine this, you go with your, your kids or by yourself, doesn't matter. Sometimes we want some alone time, Sans kids. So right. we go, you know, we bring the products back to one location, yeah. you return them, done, yeah. done. You're, you're credited with your return, process the payment, um, and the shopper goes on their way and will most likely go and do something else in the center. They've, right. either, they've most likely planned to go to another store. They're going to the food court with their kids to get a bite to eat. So this whole concept of, you know, oh, we don't wanna take returns. I think I brought this up when we chatted last time. Look at what Kohl's did with Amazon. Same right. concept. Through Amazon returns at the back of their store, people have to go through the Kohl's store to get to the Amazon returns. What are they going to do when they return the products? They're going to turn around and probably go buy something. They're not going to walk out the door. I mean, you could, but why wouldn't you just ship Kohl's it? A, at Kohl's, that's an open question. But I think your point, I think your, I think your point about like, hey, let's have a meal at the mall or whatnot. But yeah, you know, I mean, you're bringing up a great point though, because it's like, okay, like online is, you know, gangbusters. We're going to need return hubs to be able to handle that product from a financial perspective as the retail industry. Plus you get into like all kinds of sustainability arguments too, in terms of we need this type of infrastructure throughout the country. Like, why wouldn't I want to have that infrastructure where all my other commercial experiences already exist versus forcing me to go to like FedEx, 
or the post office or anything else like that if it makes my life easier. But but you guys are doing the, the solves really unique because you're saying, look, there's going to be this kind of concierge point within that experience regardless. We're going to prove out this business case. And then, yes, we can further advance the technology beyond that. But this is the right first step with which to do this. Am I thinking about that the right way? Yeah, hundred percent. And there's there's going to be other technologies that you can layer onto this, whether through us or other third parties. I mean, it doesn't have to. Everything doesn't have to run through us. And I think that's one thing to to get to get through here is yeah. Is it even from a return standpoint? There are companies yep. out there. Uh, sure. I don't have to name them, but there are other companies out there that we can bolt onto. And I think that's that approach has really become prevalent in the retail space with this headless commerce, you know, concept of you know, being able to bolt on best in class solutions to, you know, for retailers to get what they want done, you know, you know, maybe we're the product discovery company and then another company is the cart and facilitating the check-in. Another one is this solution and that solution. And you could have eight to 10 companies bolted together from a headless commerce standpoint. We're not, we're not in this necessarily to control the whole entire end-to-end -end experience. Even delivery, I'll say we've had conversations yeah. and a partnership coming up that we'll be announcing soon where you know, we're not we're not providing the, the, the delivery, the same day delivery right. uh, company. They already have one. Okay, cool. Bolt on, tie in our services, and away we go. So yeah, it, it the returns piece is is centralized, which is the main, the main piece to this whole thing. But then it gets people doing other stuff in your shopping center. And and that has that has some weight to it too. And it makes people care more. It gives them a, another outlet to care about and a way to care about local commerce, you know, at the end of the day too, in terms of the mall that's right down the street, which is really, I think, really important to people endemically. Um, yeah, I mean, if I'm making predictions, I, I think what you just said is probably the most important part here, which is like, okay, let's make predictions. Like, how's this going to play out? I think one, the business model gets proved out and then you're probably going to have, you know, headless commerce or quote cloud commerce type redundant technology systems that the retailers can plug into really easily. They don't have to replace and rip out their existing systems. They just plug into those really easily and say, like, if I've got, oh, I'm gonna plug into this, all right, it can connect to a debt mine and it's super structured throughout every mall in the country and boom, we're good to go. We do that integration, you know, hopefully once nationally, like that should be pretty easy. It's just a redundant system and boom, everything's ready and, and everyone can breathe easily and sleep easily at night and all of a sudden, Malls throughout the country are now shoppable online. I mean, I think that's where I predict we're going. Um, it's cool to hear you say it like that too. That's something I've always thought. How? What's What's next, Jesse? Oh, go ahead. Just, and, and just on that point, everybody yeah, no. gets, talks about sort of the last mile piece to this whole thing from sort of the checkout onwards. But don't forget the the, the prior to that in, in the pre-shop stage too, right? I mean, we provide product discovery. What can happen and, and personalization and recommendations? That's really our our core engine, you know, commerce and everything else. But prior to that, we work to bolt on loyalty and all these other mechanisms. Everybody forgets sort of about the front end side or yeah. you know, still the back end. But you know, the front side of this whole thing of being able to recognize customers, you've got to sign it, personalize. Right. You can give them, you know, these offer management platforms that have been out there. You can still offer people things. It's it's all encompassing. We're just sort of that middle crux to this whole thing that gets you up and running. Again, building the foundation. Yeah. But then you start to bolt on loyalty. You can start to bolt on, you know, same day delivery, logistics. Yeah. All these other things come together and sort of this yeah. convergent technology. And, and to your point, that's where it's going. Yeah, that's that's the unlock for me today. Actually, I never thought about that. It's like the unlock, the easy stuff is actually everything we were just talking about. The hard part is actually how do you create a front end experience for something that really hasn't done before? How people can shop local and their local physical entity. What does that look like? How does it work? How does it interact? And the only way to do that is for actually shopping mall operators to actually start doing it so you can learn and A-B test and figure out what works and what doesn't. All the other stuff. That's just going to come with time. And it's, it's actually pretty freaking straightforward when you think about it. So I'm, that's a really cool point, man. I'm you think, glad you, you think about geofencing and stuff, right? And, and yeah. customer tracking companies and data, data companies in this industry, they've been around for 10 years. I mean, you know, we'll tell you how many shoppers and come to your center, and, you know, redeem an offer or whatever it is. That's been, that's been going on for a ton of, ton of years now but the the missing component is that is that front end and middle piece where it's actually products they're engaging with 
and then you can still bolt on those other strategies yeah. and you'll do your geofencing, but at least you know what they've engaged with first, what they're interested in yeah. versus just like, hey, you know, they engaged with, you know, a store, they clicked on a favorite store and entered the, the geofence of the mall. You can really start to get good back to data and insights. You can really start to understand who your customers are and, and do some key targeting messages towards them. Yeah, I see. Yeah, even the marketing side and how that can potentially make that that whole science around that it, uh, better. That's more interesting. That, yeah, that's more interesting too. You're right. I mean, we've had you know Amazon marketplaces and eBay marketplaces forever, but we've never had a mall marketplace that functions like this. So knowing what that front end user experience design is is still an open question. But you've got to experiment to get there. Okay, so back to back to the candid pointy question too. Like what? How long does it take to do this? Like, so I'm a mall listening to this, and it's okay that. But that sounds really interesting. I want to get this started. Like what, what's all entailed here? Yeah, it depends on, depends on how far you want to go. If you just want to do sort of the foundational experience and, and get something up and running, uh, you know, fairly quickly and, and, you know, just making them all discoverable as we, as we said before, depends on how many centers you want to do. I mean, we can turn around, you know, I think I said last time we did, uh, we did Centennial, we built Centennial in three months. We can do and that was eight centers, but we can do yeah. eight centers now in maybe three weeks to a month. Wow. So you, you start to you start to understand the scaling, the scalability of this, and it's huge. I mean, it's basically getting to the point where it's plug and play. And yeah, it can can get up and running pretty fast. When you want to do sort of the the logistical piece and con layer and commerce and bolt on those those different pieces. Sometimes it's added, but it's not months. It's you know a month maybe, but it's it's more measured in weeks at that point to make sure that um, you know not on our end from the technology standpoint, but everything at the center is set up. Your you know your staff, whether you know we're supporting with that or or the the mall owner is is running the labor piece. Your signage, your your messaging, your all of that sort of stuff, right? Your marketing campaigns, your marketing strategy on how to communicate to your customers. There's there's a lot that goes into that side of it versus our technology. So it's not a limitation of us getting it up and running. It's more so making sure that the communication strategy and labor strategy is there uh, on the mall side. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like mostly it's just about getting people aligned on kind of what the marching orders that are that need to happen. Yeah. And is it just, I, I've never asked this before, but are we talking just, you know, and maybe that's your focus and smartly so in the beginning, but are we just talking malls here or is it, you know, our, can we, this seems like it's also applicable to, you know, to strip centers, smaller, you know, shopping center locations, yep. uh, you know, even if the retailers like say plug into the mall, like there's many of them that are in off mall locations where the same theory would essentially come into play. Um, yep. How are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, totally. From a, from a strip center standpoint, it's, it all, it all rolls into one and same with our open air strategy. I mean, you can have 30 tenants in a, an open air, um, you know, concept, uh, and and we can still do this, run this same playbook, obviously with some modifications. But think about, um, you know, you start to think about pop up shops. You start to think about all these, uh, you know, from a leasing standpoint, how you would track new tenants and and offering these sorts of capabilities to potential tenants or to pop ups as a showcase of, look, we can you know, we can drive additional uh, digital real estate for you on top of the physical real estate you're, you're popping up and this is how much exposure you're getting and blah, blah, blah. And when it comes to lease negotiations and all these sorts of things too, like there's a big impact if you can prove as an owner or landlord that you drove online sales for a pop-up shop, you know, especially right. when you're just some long-term rents and leases and all that sort of stuff so there's a there's a whole other world to to this sort of thing but yeah not to deviate too much from your question i mean from strip centers to bias and, and downtown associations for sure like this this has endless possibilities um you know that we that we can support with well even even going back to the retail side of this too i think like when you talk about like the history and legacy of you know being about you know search and and you know a, a good front end experience that's another unlock for me today too, which is like, you know, I think of like the target Ulta partnership. I've been, I've been all over how that needs to not just be about an in-store partnership, but it actually needs to be about creating a marketplace through target properties, target.com properties. 
properties that enable you to get the best of the best of everything that Alta has to offer, which is a different setup than like that traditional arrangement. And essentially that's what you're saying here, which is that you can have kind of that, even the retailer could create its own localized marketplace for its local store, even on its own, depending on its size. And, and that's, that's kind of groundbreaking too, in terms of, you know, how you think about this and where this idea goes. Well, what's, what's the next phase, man? What are we going to see from you guys next year in the next six months? You kind of blew my socks off again in what, like four or five months time. What, what's coming next? Cause we're going to have you back on, I think the next time you're coming around here. So what's, what, what can we expect? Uh, scale. I mean, the scale big, the big thing for us, you're going to see a number of partnerships announced here in the next, you know, month to two months that, okay. that are going to get people's attention. And, you know, we're, we're going to, we're basically going to see a, a mass shift in this industry towards these types of platforms. And basically if, if, you know, understood hesitancy and I understand first mover advantage and a lot of people can't digest sort of being a first mover, but essentially it's, it's going to get, if things, you know, the dominoes fall the way they're supposed to here or where they're, where they're going to the, the concept of first mover is passed. Centennial's there. We've got other partnerships launching this one card solution that I can't quite mention right now, uh, but you'll see that soon. Uh, and essentially from there, you've got past first mover, you're into sort of not laggard territory, but you're starting to fall behind if you aren't doing this. Yes, I know things are opening up. The economy's opening up, especially in the US, not so much Canada, we're a whole other conversation. But, uh, you know, the yes, things are opening up, but you still need to future proof your shopping center and you still need to get these foundational experiences in. Because as I mentioned, it will enable you to basically run any marketing program that you want to. If you want to run a more concrete and sophisticated loyalty program, you can. If you want to uh, run logistics and returns and all this sort of stuff, you can. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot to it here uh, that we can un unpack, but primarily in the next in the next sort of four to five months, you're going to see uh, maybe a funding announcement. I can tease Sweet. that a little bit. Yeah. And uh, and then obviously just scale across a number of a number of different property owners. So. That, that would be my feedback for, for anyone listening to this that's sort of on the fence or just thinking about it. We can have a conversation. Uh, we can start small too. It doesn't need to be, like I said, this end-to-end -end commerce piece and you need to figure out all these logistical pieces. Start small. Just start understanding the data. Start understanding, you know, are people actually engaging with this in your territory at your center? Um, and that's sort of my feedback is to start sort of crawl, walk, run approach, right? Not just this sign the agreement and run to commerce. It's like, no, no, we can, we can go slowly. That that's, and I want to close on that too, because, and I want to set the context here for everyone listening and watching too, is that I'm getting, so everyone understands the heat in this space. I'm getting asked about this topic in general, probably three or four times a week by different people uh, through various conversations that I'm having. So it is really heating up. And the other important thing I think in what you said, Jesse, is, 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 is the MVP type of approach you guys are taking. Like I will get at one of the questions I get asked a lot actually within that conversation is, you know, should I put in some type of like communal logistics hub? Like, should I start running fulfillment for the different retailers as a mall operator? And I say, yes, possibly, but not right now. Have you done all of these other things? And what you just walked through for everyone that was listening closely was really the sequential plan to see if that's right for your property and to figure out what the right answers are to all of the open questions before you go that step. And it starts by having a great foundational front end online and then figuring out what are the services that you're going to need to provide your local consumers as you go along. You can start to add those other kind of shiny pennies, so to speak, at any point in time that you want to, but you have to start in the right place. If you start too far afield, you're never going to get anywhere. So with that as a closing, thank you, man. I love this. I love this conversation. I learned a ton in this conversation. There were, I think a few times where I was like, wow, okay, that was a big unlock. So again, Jesse, if people, people have been talking to you on the chat, if they want to get in touch with you, like what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, for sure. Either through, uh, either through LinkedIn, you can shoot me a private message or my email is jesse at adeptmind.ai. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Again, that's been Jesse Michael, Managing Director of AdeptMind, company to watch. They're doing some really cool things. Hopefully we'll have them on again. To everyone listening, to everyone watching, as always, 
Be careful out there.